And I just started reading uh, Brewing Up a Business. And uh -huh. I was checking out that story about your first homebrew. Yeah. I wonder if you could relay that story to the viewers. First homebrew I ever did. I was living in New York and I was working at a bar in the Upper East Side that served good beer. And the owner was only a few years older than I was. So we got way into it and decided to homebrew. And I think in that era, that must have been like 93 or 94. And there was uh, only one homebrew store in all of Manhattan called Little Shop of Hops. I don't remember huh. where. I think it was like Midtown area, tiny little closet of a store. And we went in and got all our, our ingredients. And on my way home, I went by a bodega, and there was all these sour cherries out there. And so I just bought a big bag of them kind of on a, you know, on a whim and brought them home and uh, decided to throw I had a pale ale recipe, like a yeah. par partial malt, so it had like some crystal and uh, some different, a little bit darker grains. And yeah. then the rest was a base malt uh, syrup. Yeah. And then it had pellet pelletized hops. And then I just uh, threw in the cherries right at the end of the boil and let it steep and simmer while it came down in heat. It turned out awesome. It was really good. And I stood up. And at that party, the first time we served it, first of all, in that era, there wasn't, I didn't know sanitation rules so well. <laughs> and there were these the old black label, Carling Black Label, used to come yeah. in these big ass, like rounded bottles. Mm -hmm. And the homebrew store was selling those. So I bought them. I sterilized them in my oven <laughs> instead of washing them with Bee Bright or something. Yeah. And I took them out with like uh, kitchen salad tongs and put them out on the floor to, to, draw, to get cooled down. And on bottling day, I went to get them off the floor and they were stuck to the shitty carpet in the apartment. <laughs> so I had to take an X-Acto knife and cut out chunks of our carpet. So every single bottle had its own built-in coaster. Sure, yeah. It was nice. <laughs> and the beer turned out excellent. I stood up in front of my room full of my roommates. And my roommates in that era were the guys in the MTV show called The State. So oh, it was like, yeah. Uh, yeah. so it was at the first time I served homebrew, there was in the room was Tom Lennon, so Lieutenant Dangle <laughs> uh, from Not Marino 911, Ken Marino, actor, uh, Joe Latruglio, and, and, I, and for some reason Ricky Lake was there too. Uh, and <laughs> wow! I, and I, I, I served the homebrew and, I, and it, it turned out great. And I stood up on the couch and I said, this is what I want to do in my life. I want to be a commercial brewer. <laughs> and then my next two ba batches of homebrew sucked. <laughs> but I'd already told all my roommates I was going to be a brewer. So, so you committed. I went through with it anyways. So that was kind of our baptism by fire, my baptism by fire. And is that experience... I mean, do you think about that experience a lot as the company has grown? And I do, because, changed? you know, the, from that moment that I walked by the bodega, I was like, wait a second, I don't have to brew the same recipe just because I got it out of a homebrew store. Maybe I'll throw this into it. And I was walking yeah. by cherries. And really, that's informed our whole mission. You know, our purpose is off-centered ales for off-centered people. Mm -hmm. And when I started the day after that first homebrew, I went to the library and said, I'm going to be a brewer. And it was like... Internet wasn't really, I didn't know about the internet yet, so yeah. I was in the, in the library in New York and doing like LexisNexis searches yeah. in that era, it might have even been microfiche or something, yeah. was, <laughs> and uh, learning about all these breweries that were opening. In that era, mostly Pacific Northwest, Colorado was taken off, New England was taken mm -hmm. off, and there were awesome beers being made, but they were mostly beers that were derived from continental styles, Pilsners, right. Lagers, Sam Adams, Pale Ales, England, Sierra. Yeah. So we were, you know, I thought, you know, the way that we could maybe stick out in such a crowded marketplace was to brew beers that had no stylistic reference points right. and right. just kind of l view the entire culinary landscape as potential ingredients for our beer. Yeah. And that started with our first batch of homebrew and right when we opened Dogfish, initial recipes included stuff like uh, chicory stout was right out of the gates, pumpkin ale, raison d'etre, mm -hmm. Indian brown, which is kind of the, proto as far as I know, the earliest like black IPA or dark IPA yeah. that we started brewing right in the mid 90s. So we've always kind of, uh, you know, kind of followed our own muse and it's always been about considering different uh, unique ingredients and processes right. and how we, how we uh, do our recipes. Yeah, and more more so than any other brand, I think you guys embody that homebrew mentality. Yeah, I mean that's this is a, this is what you're in today is probably the most pimped out homebrewery <laughs> in the world. So you know we're still as adventurous as we are back when we were brewing on the the half barrel. Yeah. But now we're just a little more organized, and I got right. great, great people like Patrick and and Tim and Nick and and the management here and the are really great about keeping me 
focused on if it's an idea for an exotic recipe, they're all in. They're all for us doing something unique. Yeah. But they're like, instead of just brewing 400 barrels of it, why don't we do a few more test batches, Sam? Why don't we take a full year to, you know, let it uh, develop it yeah. the right way? Yeah. Is but, that is that sort of we 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 caught up with the the employees on the small batch project? Uh -huh. Is that sort of what that does for you guys? Allow? Yeah. I mean, the you know the it's an opportunity for a creative you know, expression for anybody in our company to participate in. And it does lots of things like our bocce courts outside. It lets coworkers at Dogfish that might not rub up each, against each other in their daily work life, mm -hmm. uh, really get to know each other mm -hmm. and recognize what each person's contributing to the company. Right. So on a bocce team, you might have a forklift driver on the same team with the chief operating officer. And right. in a small batch brew, you might have a, a waiter uh, you know, that's uh, on a team with uh, a tour uh, guide here, from right. one from Rehoboth, one from Milton. And it's a way to kind of recognize that we're all trying to go in the same direction while getting to know each other uh, as people. In the case of Small Batch, there's the other great component of uh, creative expression. Yep. When we do have to brew such big batches, even a one-off for us now out of here really needs to be at least six or 800 barrels. Yeah. for us not to piss off customers, but we have to get at sure. least enough out to each market so that hardcore dogfish fans can find the beer at least once. That's kind of our goal when we yep. do one-offs. But small batch allows us to just do whatever we want at the smallest scale. And then it's cool to see our community come together, vote on these beers, take them through sensory, choose the ones we love the best, and recognize those people that brewed them with an opportunity to, to brew that beer commercially at our pub. Yeah, as you guys are growing exponentially. No, oh, oh shit. Yeah. <laughs> He's getting closer. Whoa. Why well, are you attacking us? <laughs> and craft beer is exploding. Oh, oh geez. I'm going to have to start over now. No, I like it. It's kind of cinema verite. <laughs> you know, craft beer is exploding, and uh, you guys are just dealing with the issues of growth, whether that's with the brand or it's mm -hmm. like, the logistics and the operations. It seems like a program like that is really catered towards trying to keep people together, trying to not lose that core of the, the soul of the company. Really. Yeah, it is. And I don't think we're, we're, we're in danger of, of, of losing that. But the moments that we take outside of just brewing our core beers, any of those moments, small batch or today we're brewing positive contact with mm -hmm. Fuji apples and peppers. And, uh, and uh, those, are, uh, those are the defining moments in our, our company because that ideal of off-centeredness is something mm -hmm. that we, we hold pretty uh, holy. And, uh, getting to, to do the things outside of 60 and 90 minute, which we love, but they're our best two selling beers. Mm -hmm. And we really have, we're, our model's pretty unique, you know, in terms of a top 20 volume brewery in the country, but that one that's not interested in focusing on our flagship beers. Right. It's kind of counterintuitive, particularly from the perspective of the retailer and the distributors who really just are designed as businesses to focus on as few things as possible from each company and just sell the shit out of them. Right. To them, we're kind of a pain in the ass because we're like, no, don't just focus on those two things. We make 30, we have 36 children and we love all our children equally. <laughs> and uh, we realize it's a challenge for our retailers. So we're really thankful to them and our distributors that they understand our mission, embrace it, and are willing to carry so many different beers of ours. But we're not doing it as much for them as we are for dogfish beer enthusiasts, beer lovers. And they don't think it's a pain in the ass. They're psyched that we're doing exactly. all that. And the retailers and distributors just kind of have to deal with it. You wrote a letter to Beer Advocate? Uh-huh. Not too long ago. A while ago, ago <laughs> Dear Abby. That was my yeah. uh, Jerry Which, Maguire letter. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and we loved it, oh, FYI. Yeah. But we got a lot of responses from our viewers that were just so happy that you had written that. And what was, what was the impetus behind writing that letter? You know, I, I love the beer advocate community, and I've been a member. I don't know what my date is on my thing, but I yeah. know I've been there for. I remember when 90 Minute was the highest ranked beer on on that, yeah. and I had an interview with Jason or Todd. Yeah, and I was like, Mariah, can you show me how to use this internet thing so I can <laughs> correspond with these people in Boston? Uh, so I've been going there since then. I don't know if it's late 90s or 2000 around there. Yeah. And the dialogue's great. And the, the reason there's thousands of different beers from thousands of different breweries is because taste is subjective and everybody's palate's different. That's why there should be thousands of beers. That's why I don't, I, I'm cool with people saying, I don't like that beer. Mm -hmm. uh, what I'm not cool with people saying is that beer sucks because right. it doesn't suck to other people or it wouldn't exist. 
Right. And also, I think there's institutional knowledge that sometimes does not uh, get considered in some of the dialogue. If you look at sure. the average user's life on Beer Advocate, I don't know how long the average member's been there, but two or three years. And you know, to see them beating up on a dogfish or a Rogue or a Sierra or a Sam Adams is really frustrating because our breweries were pretty you know, influential more than a decade ago in broadening the, the um, availability of different kinds of beers. And you got awesome breweries now like Founders or uh, Shorts or The Brewery mm -hmm. out in LA doing great experimental stuff. And it's cool that they're getting their props for it, yeah. but when they're getting their props instead of, and saying, I don't like those old generation <laughs> breweries, they suck, I like these newer these breweries, it's kind of short-sighted. Yeah. And uh, you know, so I just wanted to remind people, hey, you know, we've been f flying the flag of creative brewing for years, we're glad that you think you don't like 10 of our beers, but that's why we make 36 beers, you know? Right, exactly. So I, I doubt that you can't find at least a few that you like. Uh, and I think that message is important because a rising tide floats all ships. The, cra the beer advocate, the real insider community, sometimes you get the sense that it's kind of like, you know, punk rock where they're like, oh, I loved uh, Green Day when they only had a four song EP on an indie label. Yeah. Once Dookie came out and reached the pop charts, they suck. Yeah. You know, or like the saying that I used, I think, in that thing was uh, that nobody goes to that restaurant anymore. It's too busy. Yeah, you know, it's basically saying one, once other people discover it, it's not cool. And that's really dangerous because craft beer collectively, including Sam, Am Sam Am's numbers, is only 6% market share. Exactly. And we're going to get marginalized out of existence, all this creativity, if the largest international breweries are successful in making everybody just, just focus on their beers. Yeah. So we've got to stay together. And it seemed like a reminder to me that the community is is very small. Mm -hmm. You know, when people are out talking about beer, they're supporting a, a brewery. You know, whether it's the craft beer scene, it's an owner, it's a brewer, it's a homebrew club. Mm -hmm. They're all the same people. Yep, it's and they the same go movement. through the same channels and they communicate to each other. Mm -hmm. So things that are said, I think people are kind of surprised. Like, oh, we're actually listening. Yeah, we, yeah. we hear you talking. Yeah, like, yeah, you know? <laughs> we do. Yeah. We're and we're the same people. Yep, you know, yep. we were once you. So right. I right. just think that it was a refreshing, to me, it was a refreshing reminder that we are a community and yep. we have to stick together as a community. We can't fight amongst ourselves. No, I agree because there, yeah. are, there are forces out there that don't uh, want to see the, the definition of a craft brewery succeed, meaning a craft brewery is a small, independently owned you know, company and there are other breweries out there that want craft brewery to just mean, oh, a beer that looks crafty but is made by a very big company right. who, you know, by nature of, they're great businesses. The, great, the breweries are great, the, the largest breweries in the world are great businesses or they wouldn't have become the largest breweries in the world. But a public company, you know, with a, with a board of directors that, that votes is, is uh, you know, legally be held to having the number one priority be maximizing shareholder value. Right. Uh, and that's a very different perspective than a brewery like ours that says, you know what, let's spend $140,000 on a, a Palo Santo wooden tank or $63,000 right. on a tanker truck of, uh, of grape must that's been infected by Botrytis. <laughs> yeah, Those yeah. are decisions that if this was a public company, I'd be fired for making. You know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> now, Switching gears a little bit, we were at the, the meeting last night for the Del Marva United yep. Home Brewers Club meeting. It was awesome. The nice. hospitality was great. Nice. The energy was great. Now, you've had a big hand in that club over the years. We started that club with uh, Doug Griffith and Terry and Jess and a bunch of people. And it was just like eight people at a table up upstairs at the brew pub in the late 90s. Yeah. Uh, Doug had just started a homebrew store mm -hmm. out of the side of his house in Millsboro down the road from here. Mm -hmm. And Doug is this great MacGyver guy. He helped us build our five barrel brew house uh, okay. out, of, out of used tanks. So right in that era, you know, we, the home brewing and commercial brewing side of this Delmarva Peninsula it's kind, of, kind of grew up together, you know? Yeah. And so we've all, it's all stayed together and we've hosted events out here uh, for home brewers. We, uh, isolated a Delaware native yeast strain on a peach farm about 10 miles from here. Uh, we went out there when, when it was the end of peach season, so there were a bunch of really 
ripe peaches on the ground, sure. lots of fruit flies, and we set out these traps and trapped the, the fruit flies, sent the petri dishes to our lab and to the University of Delaware Agricultural Lab, mapped the DNA of what we found, the different species of bacteria and ye wild yeast that we yeah. found, and we isolated this really nice yeast that throws these tropical notes, and we grew it up and, just, and we made the decision that it would, could only be bought uh, commercially by Delaware breweries or Delaware home brewers. Wow. Um, so a bunch of Delaware home brewers, we you know, spent hundreds of dollars in our lab to grow up sample size packets of it and invited the Delaware home brewing community to just come and gave out that yeast for them to bro brew with. So yeah, we still have a, a great uh, interweaving of the commercial and home brewing scenes that's awesome. here. Yeah, that's important. And we're actually using that yeast with my buddy uh, Garrett and the folks at Maui Brewing Company. Yeah. My wife Mariah and our kids were out in Maui a few weeks ago. And that yeast, since it throws those really tropical, sort of strawberry notes in the nose, I thought would be a great thing to do a tropical beer with. So I reached out to Garrett, and we're doing a beer called Liquid Breadfruit. Uh, oh. Beer has been <laughs> called liquid bread for yeah. centuries, and breadfruit is a tropical fruit that grows in, in Hawaii. Okay. So we're using our tropical yeast with their bread, breadfruit and some uh, toasted papaya seeds as well. Uh, liquid breadfruit uh, is going to be coming out in fall, I think. Garrett's doing a, a bunch of it, so it'll reach uh, this area of the country as well. It'll be neat to see the Dogfish logo on a can of on beer. On a can. <laughs> That's funny. Yep. So we had a chance to catch up with the, the folks over at the distillery. Mm -hmm. John and Allison. John, John and Allison. Yep. And when was that decision made that you, were, you guys were going to pursue spirits? Well, kind of like uh, that moment when I was walking by the bodega and saw the cherries in the corner bin. Yeah. I was dropped, back in the day when I was the only salesperson at Dogfish, I could get two pallets of beer in my pickup truck and I would kind of drive like this to Washington <laughs> DC or Philly and Baltimore and drop off the beer and do sales for the day. And I was coming back from one of those trips to DC with two pallets of beer, an empty pickup truck. And on our way home on 404 between here and DC, there's this awesome scrapyard called Billy Warren Scrapyard. And, you know, 30 or 40 percent of our equipment the first five years was this built, bought from this scrapyard yeah. and we just turned it into brewing equipment. Yeah. And I went by it one day and I saw this big chunk of metal stuck in the mud and it was shaped like a space capsule yeah. or like a, and I'm like, that could be a really interesting pot still. Yeah. And so I pulled in, pay, paid them the money, all the profits that I made selling the two pallets of beer and then some and came home with that, and Mariah's like, oh. <laughs> and, uh, and there were some folks from Appleton's uh, that were dogfish fans and loved our worldwide stout, and I called them up and said, hey, I'll trade you a bunch of worldwide stout if you help me engineer this okay. uh, into a distillery. And so they gave us some plans and ideas, and we welded two kegs together to turn it into a condenser, uh, and we put that system together. We were the second craft brewery in the country to open a distillery behind our friends at Anchor. Yep. So I think we've had our distillery almost 10 years now. And because it's so landlocked up upstairs in our pub, yeah. it's remained a lot more of a, a local secret than say our beer has. Mm -hmm. But we, you know, the same opportunity to do off-center things in distilling, uh, you know, it's is very similar to what we do in the brewing. So yeah. if, for example, our rums are made with all local Del Delaware yep. wildflower honey and molasses, you know, we, we do a, a really nice uh, uh, chocolate vodka We're using uh, chocolate nibs from our buddies at Askinosi Chocolate, an artisanal chocolate company in St. Louis. And, uh, you know, we, we definitely want to expand our distillery world. We see a great, we, we're getting more and more attention for it, but more and more frustration from people who can't come here and get it. get it. Yeah. So I think our distillery is on pace to grow 40 or 50 percent this year. And then frankly, we're going to be out of room up there, as yeah. you saw. Yeah. So we wrote, recently wrote our own legislation with friends. And we've done that, I think, five or six times now in the, in yeah. the country. And we were up on the Senate floor a few weeks ago. And it, uh, we got our a craft distilling statute passed. Nice. And now our buddy uh, Jack, uh, uh, our, our uh, um, Jack Markell, our, our governor, is going to sign that, make it, turn it into law. And then so now we have the opportunity to expand our distillery. We don't know Excellent. exactly how or where, right. but somewhere in the dogfish world, we want to expand our distillery probably in 2013. Great, yeah. great.
so today we're brewing Positive Contact, mm -hmm. and uh, you know we're huge music lovers here. Uh, yeah. It's probably my other big passion besides brewing is is music. So you know through the years we've reached out to lots of friends and done projects mm -hmm. like with the family of Miles Davis, yeah. uh, our buddy Johnny Langford from the Mekons, punk band from the UK does yep. some of our labels, um, and I through mutual friends uh, Dan the Automator. Uh, reached out to me and said, hey, you know, I love what you're doing with those music things. It's taken me and Del, the funky homo sapien, 10 years to write the follow-up album to the, the Deltron 3030. Yeah. And, and when he told me that, I was like, oh my God, that was one of the most pivotal albums for me. <laughs> and he's like, want to do something? I'm like, hell yeah. And I, when we do our, our collaborations, we want to try and find a really authentic way into it. Right. And, you know, uh, you hear of some people saying they have sort of a, a collaboration fatigue, like, okay, all these breweries have collaborated. Collaborations are over. Yeah, yeah. And that's just bullshit, because <laughs> if there's an interesting, authentic way into a collaboration, you should do it. Um, yeah. If it's just sticking two logos on a bottle for the hell of it on another pale ale, there's right. probably not much inspiration there. But our whole industry was founded on collaboration, you know, from yeah. the moment uh, Charlie Papazian visited Michael Jackson at the British Beer Festival and Charlie said, hey, this is really cool. I, we should do one in America. Yeah. And Michael Jackson said, yeah, that would be nice, except what would you serve for beer? Because American beer in that era wasn't very adventurous. <laughs> and then, but then you go from there to the moment, first time Ken Grossman drove a pickup truck from Chico down to San Francisco to yeah. buy a used piece of equipment from Anchor, from Fritz yep. Maytag. That spirit of collaboration is the, in our DNA as brewers. Yeah. Um, so we wanted a really authentic way into this collaboration with Dan. He and I are, are also big foodies and love food. So we, we I, you know, I thought that'd be a really fun way in. So what the project ended up being is we sent him every single beer that we make. He kept notes on every beer and told me what he liked about each beer. And we narrowed down his tastes based on wow. trying every single one of our beers and what kind of ingredients he liked. And then I said, you know, free form, just send, out, send me out stream of consciousness your favorite culinary ingredients. So between the beers he liked and his favorite culinary ingredients, I took those things. I met him in New York City at Beereria, which okay. is a brew pub on a rooftop that we, we dogfish and Baladan Brewery and Beer Del Borgo Brewery do the beer program and train the brewer and come up with the recipes. And we sat up there with a cheese grater and teaspoons and da 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 and took the base beers that he liked and started just kind of shaving chunks of different ingredients into those beers wow. and swirling them and trying them. Yeah. And, uh, and from that, we came up with the, the final recipe. And probably the most uh, forward uh, ingredients in it are the, fu or the Fuji apple uh, juice grown here at Smith Orchards in Delaware. Uh, and, uh, uh, and the peppers, I would say, are, are just a subtle heat at the end of it. And we also found an heirloom wheat from a company that grows, uh, you know, ancient wheats uh, down in South Carolina. Oh, wow. And that's Very a, cool. a, a neat component of it as well. So we wanted to also make this collaboration even more uh, kind of robust than just our the D Dan, Deltron 30, and Dogfish. So the way the food component worked is we did the test batch of this beer. Mm -hmm. And then we sent out the sample bottles along with, and then Dan did four dub remixes of songs from the, from the, uh, from the, the upcoming album. He mm -hmm. did four totally new remixes. So we sent out CDs with those remixes and two bottles of the beer to five of our favorite chefs around the world. And then, wow. uh, and then what they, so it's Joe Beef, the guys from Montreal. We have a chef from San Francisco. We have uh, Sean Paxton, the homebrew yep. chef. Mario Batali and David Chang. Um, we sent them all the beer and said, drink one bottle and listen to the four songs. And while you're doing that, think of what recipe would be a great complement to drinking wow. a whole bottle and listening to those four songs. That sounds so cool. And so this, every single six pack of this beer, 750 ml bottle six pack, comes with a vinyl album with the four songs on it and a sleeve that has the five recipes from the fa famous chef. Wow, so very cool. Should be a really very neat, cool. neat uh, collaboration. It'll come out, I think, in um, June. Yeah. It sounds like there's so much integrity and in art that goes into what you guys do. I yeah. Mean, it, just, it doesn't seem like you guys just come out with a beer. No. There's a story. Yep. There's a context to it. We work hard on uh, the, the storytelling component of it. We love seeing the other breweries grow in America, our friends that have breweries, 
but frankly, we try really hard to not watch what other breweries are doing. And so I usually look at the music and the art world and culinary world for more inspiration than I would mm -hmm. uh, for, for the brewing world. But we, we do, and I don't think it's pretentious at all to, no. to treat beer as an art form, you know? Yeah. It's, uh, it deserves as much respect as painting and certainly uh, the culinary chef world and stuff Absolutely. like that. Um, that we were recently, I was a finalist in the James Beard Awards, which are kind of the, the big food world awards. Both myself and Garrett Oliver was a finalist this year as well. I was a finalist last year. Neither of us won, still a wine person won. Uh, <laughs> but what's really telling is they've now changed the name of that award. It used to be, when I was nominated last year, it was for uh, uh, the Wine and, and Spirits uh, Award. And now, finally, it's called the Wine, Spirits, and Beer Award. Wow. So it shows that craft beer is Interesting. gaining respect in the culinary world, slowly but yeah. surely, as sort of an art form, which is yeah. nice. Yeah. So um, what's up with Beer 30? You guys are going to be here for Beer 30, right? We are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you timed it well. <laughs> uh, we usually, every, every Friday at 4.30, it's probably the only like giant room of cubicles that you'll see where people are yelling at each other to stop working and start drinking. We're like, it's Beer 30. <laughs> Shut your computer up. Get downstairs. You get yelled at for not drinking at, at work. Um, and so, yeah, it's just a tradition where every Friday, at 4.30, we meet here in our tasting room. Our, all of our coworkers are invited. We uh, get to catch up and outside of the work week, celebrate. We made it through another work week together. Yep. Um, and just ch chance to be social. And usually, you know, brewers are great about trading wampa, wampum, liquid wampum. And when a <laughs> brewer visits a brewer, you usually trade liquid. So yeah. whoever, if it's Patrick goes on a, a visit a, to Victory Brewery or someone goes, uh, and visit to another brewery, they usually take home a case. Okay. And then I, in the mail, always trade people, you know, yeah. newer brewers have started up and said, hey, I read your book, I love that I'm sending you beer. I say always that if you do, I'm gonna share it with my, my coworkers at Beer yep. 30 and get back to you and let you know what we all thought of it. Um, so we'll see what came in my office today and I'm sure there'll be beers down here from other breweries. Oh, very cool. Uh, that we always try to serve at Beer 30 and we also use Beer 30 as the, sensory component to the small batch program. Yep. So a lot of times at Beer 30, there'll be one of the beers that comes through small batch that's served at Beer 30, and we put out our sensory um, analysis sheets, and the coworkers okay. all judge that beer, submit those forms, and that's what informs the decision of which beers from small batch Perfect. make it uh, to a pub commercial batch. Awesome. So we'll have a good old time. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Me too. <laughs> all right. All right. Thank you for your time. Cheers. What's Thank that you for your time. hat? I like that. It's very Paul Bunyan-esque. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys for your time. Yeah.